Kim, you picked a great time to visit us because it is actually our 31st birthday. The museum opens its doors to the public July 12th, 1991. Today is July 13th, so we just turned 31. And unlike most natural history museums, we're really unique in that we were founded by the local community. And even today, we remain an independent 501c3, meaning that we are here supported by the community for all of these years. And we're really able to be a community hub. Um, so right now we have our Da Vinci exhibition that'll run through September. On Nevada Day, we're gonna be hosting Dino Ween, where children in costume will get free museum admission. And we're gonna have a whole um, mad scientist theme this year. We're also celebrating the 100th anniversary of the discovery of King Tut's tomb by Howard Carter in November with some special programming there. And then to round out the year, we're gonna offer December to Remember Again, which is this beautiful gathering of local community members from any cultural, religious organization, and they can create an exhibit, uh, a workshop and or decorate a tree if that's part of their tradition and that goes in our main hallway and it's just it's just really beautiful so when you think natural history museum we're a little different than the rest but that makes us special it's interesting because we are so young compared to the big natural history museums of the world our collection really tells a story about adaptations and the differences in different regions of the world. So when this is not our Da Vinci exhibition gallery, it's actually an international wildlife gallery where, especially when we have school groups that come through, we can start to talk about these ecosystems and adaptations. And as you move through the museum, that's a theme that continues. But then of course, we also go back in time to ancient Egypt as we're talking about the Nile flooding and how culturally um, um, humans have adapted over time too, back into the prehistoric gallery, going back in time even further. We talk about the different dinosaurs and the different periods, um, but interesting thing for us here in Nevada is that we don't find many dinosaur skeletons. Uh, we've not found a complete one to date, really, and we find a lot of trackways and we find a lot of evidence, but because of the prehistoric geology of this area, not a lot of dinosaurs, but what we do find a lot of is prehistoric mammals. So mammoths in particular. So as folks go downstairs, we have a working paleontology lab that they are actually opening up one of the field jackets of the Thule Springs mammoth tusks right now and have that on display downstairs as the um, science students from UNLV, the paleo students from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, as well as our staff members and collections um, are working on that in lifetime. Yes, we are a very proud Smithsonian affiliate, and um, we that is the one part of us being a natural history museum that's quite nice because we actually have on loan from the Smithsonian a geology exhibit um, where you can see how different wavelengths affect different minerals. Marilyn Gillespie, who's the museum's founding executive director, actually uh, worked with the artisans of Florence to bring this exhibition here as one of the last things she did before she retired. So this is, this is her legacy living on here in Las Vegas. This is um, a partnership between the Nikolai Institute and the artisans of Florence, obviously out of Florence, Italy. And what they've done is they've worked with um, historians and artisans from the area to literally take 500 years of da Vinci's codices and whatnot, or it's 500 years later now rather, but to gather them, decipher them, and then create several of his inventions from materials that would have been found in the area at that time 
only using methods that he would have had available. That's why in here you're not going to see any electronics with the inventions. It's all with um, wood and metal and natural fiber uh, fabrics and ropes. But it actually took about a week for the artisans of Florence came here and it took a week for them to work with our team. We had an awesome team here at the Museum of Staff and Volunteers from the local community that worked with them um, for the full week to put the exhibition together. They wanted to make sure we were doing justice to Da Vinci and to the work of all of the folks from behind the scenes um, because a lot of people go into making these ex exhibitions happen and we want to be sure we're not only honoring the content but the quality of the work from the folks who have worked on the exhibitions to get them here. We, we had a donor member opening so if anybody is interested in becoming a museum member it comes with some additional perks like that um, and so we did actually have a couple members of the team who stayed over. They're not based out of the U.S. They're based um, overseas. So they went home for the most part, but we did have a couple team members who stayed for the opening. And then they'll return to um, usher the exhibition onto its next stop after it leaves here in September. In between showings, they do have to oil the wood and address any concerns that might happen because just like something, um, anything else that you might make, there's wear and tear on these machines as well, just from the transport, from the climate changes, and for the ones that you can actually touch and interact with, there is a little wear and tear from the public interaction as well. They use linseed oil, yes, because they had to get a lot of it to come to this location. We think of da Vinci as an artist, but we don't really think of him often as an inventor. But these automatrons were part of his codices and part of his inventions. And so the night that we saw a moment ago is a representation of a stage prop that he had created for one of the aristocrats for a theatrical production. And the night actually had inner working similar to our drummer over here in it, where it could stand up on its own and lift its visor, which when you're thinking about totally pre-telephones, pre-electricity, pre-everything that we think of that moves today's machines, that would have been a complete marvel and truly the showstopper. But I love our drummer over here because this is the first time the drummer's been created that we've been able to find. And the thing that I love about it is there's this groove right there on that cog in the middle. And the groove actually dictates how the arms move in rhythm. So you can change the pattern of the cadence that the drummer drums by changing out that cog there. An entire team of folks. Um, not only from getting access to the proper archives and to the documents themselves, but to also deciphering them and then working with the engineering team to recreate using the, um, the resources that would have been available then. So did they actually test this so you can hear it? They did. We're not allowed to because of the wear and tear. Okay. However, and that's you'll notice that there's the red, do not touch, and then the green you can interact with. Um, however, they have tested it and, and it does function. If we look up here, we see this really bizarre parachute. And this is one where when they initially found the design drawings, they thought there's no way that this is going to work. No way at all. When we think about a modern parachute design, it is not square. But they found a note in the drawings that indicated that a very specific type of fabric was needed. And this very specific type of fabric made all the difference. So obviously he had done some sort of testing on this because once they use the appropriate type of fabric, it lets through just enough air to create the same amount of lift that we get with the parachutes that we have today. And it actually works with that type of fabric. Right? Natural fiber is natural fabric. And you can see that it's a, it's a bit sheer compared to maybe what we see in the wing up above on the flying machine, which of course would have more of a, a coasting lift. Um, and it's just, it's amazing to think that you're looking at these drawings and you, and you would think, there's no way this is gonna work, but it, it does function. That's our early helicopter over here, our aerial screw. Obviously this one didn't actually lift off the ground, but the, the thing envisioned was that it would have um, four people in it turning a crank and da Vinci had figured out that if they could get the crank going fast enough it would actually lift off. Not successful at that time, obviously not successful in the recreation. This would uh, be 15 feet across and just mammoth to, to get off the ground, um, but uses the exact same principles we see in 
in helicopters of today with the rotation needing to hit a certain speed to be able to get the lift and, and come off the ground. So even if he wasn't successful in some of his machines for the time, he could see ahead of where they could go with future enhancements. The one that I personally really enjoy is our bicycle over here. And so there was a little bit of a discrepancy because the, the drawing of the bicycle is a, a little bit different stylistically than some of his others. And so they think perhaps maybe an apprentice had worked on it a little bit with him, or, but it is still being attributed to da Vinci from all of the, the information that they were able to gather. It would have been a stage prop, again, for one of those theatrical productions, but what I really love about it is it looks like a modern bicycle. Looking at this, there's no question, it's a bike. It even has the chain system that we see on modern bicycles now. But the thing that's amazing about it is this was the stage prop. And then we don't see this design of bike again until after we've gone big wheel, little wheel, terribly dangerous. And then this design sort of comes back hundreds of years later as a safety bike alternative to where bicycles had been um, in between. And so it's really interesting to me that we, we see something that's so close to where we've landed today. And yet in Da Vinci's time, it was just something he popped out as a stage prop. He has kind of an interesting background in general because his parents weren't married uh, whenever he was born. So he wasn't able to attend traditional schooling and he has this really different path in life from the beginning. Um, all of his education was informal on his father's estate and his uncle had actually encouraged him to look to nature for his answers to different things. And so you see his mind is working really, really differently just from the get-go because of the circumstances he was born into. And then on top of that, um, after he's you know been apprenticing as an artist and these different things, he actually um, becomes more of an inventor by pitching himself as a military engineer expert to um, the aristocracy of Milan. I believe it was the Duke of Milan. And so that's why you'll see a lot of the inventions here actually are like a tank or even the scuba gear was to sneak up on enemies. Over there, there's um, um, a section where he's invented some things to push ladders off of walls or keep your ladder from being pushed off of walls. So while he was doing these kind of crazy stage props, he also had some very tactical functional um, inventions that, that would have given him a bit more credibility. So because we noticed that Da Vinci liked to, he explored everything, he researched everything, he did all kinds of, like he questioned everything. He learned so much in one lifetime that it would take like an entire college to teach today, it really does. And so one of the things that he has is this one, is the beautiful underwater uh, breathing apparatus, which is not quite scuba because scuba means uh, uh, self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. And this is not quite self-contained, but what you see here, it actually works, which is one of the most amazing things to me. 500 years ago, he created this underwater breathing apparatus. This part stays on the surface and it brings the air down. And there are springs and, and all things that I do not understand because I'm not an engineer, but it forces the air down to the diver. Now the point was that the person in the water would be able to sabotage the boats, the enemy boats, without the enemy noticing that there's even a person there. One of the things that Da Vinci knew though was that even if you're at three feet, if you're in your, your swimming pool at home and sitting right there where the stairs are and you're sitting on the bottom and you've got your snorkel and the snorkel is actually long enough to reach the air, your lungs do not have the capacity to bring the air down so that you can breathe. You do not, your lungs are not strong enough. And of course, if you're gonna get down under boats, it's gonna be deeper than that. And the deeper you go, the harder it is to breathe. Da Vinci knew that because he did all of these research. So it forces the air down to the diver. The other thing he knew, which is just amazing to me, you can see there are two tubes coming from this model's head. 
when you breathe out into your snorkel, if you're on the surface and you know snorkeling along, you see the little fishes, and you're just and you breathe out, you notice it's a little more difficult to breathe because as you breathe out, you have to get that that exhaled air out the tube or back into your lungs before you get fresh air. Well, you clearly can't do that with this system, so he has the second tube to take that expelled air out into the surface. It's amazing to me. So if you notice, if you've ever been out where you know there are scuba divers under the water, if they're not using a rebreather, if they're using the kind of system that we have over here, you can see the bubbles. You know where they are because you can see the bubbles. This eliminates that, among other things. So it's just absolutely amazing. And so we have this display of modern scuba gear. And we have like a mask. And the mask helps you to see. And the reason why you don't use goggles is because goggles go over the eyes alone. When you go, if you've ever dove in your pool with goggles on, 10 feet, 15 feet, it starts to push up against your eyes and it starts to get uncomfortable. Turns out that can cause actual damage, long-term damage if you don't fix that. So with a, with a mask, it covers up the nose. So because you're breathing, you have air to expel out your nose and that forces the pressure back away from your eyes. So that as, as you descend deeper into the water and there's more pressure and it pushes up against your eyes, you just push a little air out your nose and that doesn't hurt your eyes anymore. And you can still see. We have, this is called a BC, a buoyancy control device. And it works exactly like a backpack. It has straps on the back. You can see in the picture. It has straps on the back to hold your compressed air. People like to say this is oxygen. Do not dive with oxygen. It is toxic. If you dive lower than 20 feet and you're breathing 100% pure oxygen, it will kill you. This is compressed air. The same air that you're breathing now, they just compress it and put it into a tank. This is called an aluminum 80. The tank itself is aluminum. It's 80 cubic feet. It holds 3,000 pounds per square inch of pressure. That's a good amount of air. That's plenty for you for your good recreational dive. Also in here we have the boots because the boots help the fins to, to fit. The fins help you to move through the water. The tank is 37 pounds, so your entire gear that you will need, including all of the stuff that you need to bring along, it gets heavy. You cannot, I promise you, you cannot move through the water without fins. But the boots, uh, because the fins will rub up against your feet, so you really need to have boots. And we also have the regulator set. The most, the there are two aspects to this regulator set. The first stage is this cylinder looking thing with the black on top. That's the first stage. That connects to the tank. Because the tank is at 3,000 pounds of pressure, the first stage brings that down to a moderate, give or take, 1,500 pounds of pressure. The regulator, that's the, the second stage, the part that you put in your mouth, that adjusts, again, as you go deeper, the pressure is heavier. And so that adjusts as you adjust in the, in the air, in the water column. As you go deeper, it adjusts so that you don't have to fight so hard to breathe. And as you ascend, it doesn't just free flow into your mouth. And that technology is basically the same for the last 100, 150 years. It's the same technology. It's the same, the same basic concept that Jacques Cousteau used when he learned to dive. And so it's amazing that, yeah, it looks prettier, but it's basically the same thing, and it's pretty amazing. I also have a, a real basic computer, a dive computer, which we also have. A, so we have the analog shown here. It should, will tell you how much air you have in your tank, how deep you are, and then, of course, you'll need some sort of time device to tell you how long you've been there. Those are the three main important things that you need to know when you're diving so that you can use your tables. Your computer is more accurate, but if you don't have a computer, it's a good idea to know how to use your tables. And your tables help you to understand the statistics behind how deep you are, how long you've been there, and, and how 
how long you need to you need to come back up before you're in that range in the bell curve range where you might get the bends. So if anybody knows much about statistics, you have that bell curve. And so the the top of the bell curve, the the one uh, sigma is 95 percent, and the two sigmas like 98 percent. Okay, and that's that's really good. But this is uh, these if the statistics are made off of 10,000, 100,000 Navy divers. Okay. Navy divers were at the time all male, all a certain range of height, all a certain range of fitness, physical fitness, and I don't fit in it and of that that uh, envelope. So I personally don't know how well I fit into those statistics. And so my personal dive philosophy is to dive on the more conservative side, just to try to make sure that I don't get the bends, etc. Uh, and, and there are some, there are many rules many rules of scuba and they're all written in scuba diver blood just like you always hear the the navy rules uh, all the navy rules are written in naval divers uh, blood but again you have to but the one rule that you cannot break the number one rule of scuba never hold your breath because all it takes is three feet of differential for a lung over expansion injury and that lung over expansion injury might be you get some air in between your lungs and your chest, which is uncomfortable and it can be fixed, but the worst part that can possibly happen is a brain aneurysm. So seriously, if, you, if you're breathing off scuba, never hold your breath. Um, one more thing I have in here is the little slate in case you want to, because uh, we do have signals that we talk to each other but sometimes there's more that needs to be communicated than the little signals that we can do.